Hello, my name is Tamara Friedman, and on behalf of JFN, I would like to welcome you to today's important webinar on the topic of when COVID-19 is just one of many crises, the pandemic's impact on displaced persons. Today, we will be joined by experts in the field of disaster relief and humanitarian aid to learn about what is being done and what is still needed for this population. And now I would like to turn it over to Andre Spicconi, the president and CEO of the Jewish Funders Network, to help frame the conversation and to introduce our moderator and panelists for this afternoon. Thank you, Andres. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tamar, and thank you all for uh, tuning in. Um, uh, you know, we are the Jewish Funders Network, and if you've been looking at the, the number of conferences and webinars and, and virtual convenings that we've been doing during the past few weeks, you will see that they centered mostly around the Jewish community, but at JFN we believe that Jewish funders have a responsibility that goes beyond the Jewish community. And one of the imperatives of, of Judaism is the notion of tikkun olam, of the repairing the world and, and doing good and doing justice in the world at large. Uh, that's why it's very important for us at JFN to shed light over what's probably the most a vulnerable population in this in this COVID crisis. We're all suffering. We're all, you know, in different degrees, anxious and fearful. But our our situation does not compare with the plight of displaced persons, people living in uh, refugee camps, in displaced person camps, uh, people living without the protection of a sovereign state, or of any safety net whatsoever. So I think it's it's our moral obligation to to look uh, at this situation and try to and try to alleviate as much as we can as funders and as Jews uh, their their suffering uh, so Jeff N considers this a critical issue and has been always considering this a critical issue we are among the members of the multi-faith alliance for Syrian refugees and the message from from us is clear um, we as Jews especially we as Jews need to be extremely attuned to the needs of refugees and displaced uh, person. Uh, it's also important uh, for funders in this crisis, and I say this in general, to not stay in their narrow lanes, but also try to see where the biggest needs are. And this is definitely an area where the big need is. So I, I hope um, we can all gather new insights about this really tough situation in which the um, the refugees and displaced persons are. And I personally hope this can be also a call to action for all of us to, to do what we can um, to, to help them. Um, with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to my dear friend and partner, Georgia Banner, who's previous chair of JFN, immediate past chair, and uh, also my, my, my personal hero for all her work on, the, on behalf of Syrian refugees. She's the, the mind and the heart behind the Multiface Alliance for, Jewish, for Syrian Refugees, among many, many other things that she's done. And if we had two hours, I would give you her entire bio, but I'd rather we go straight to the, to the issue. Georgette, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Andres. Uh, you are very generous. And uh, I know everything you said about the importance of Jewish funders stepping up in this situation is, is heartfelt, and, and I thank you for that. And um, I thank all of you who are logged on from around the country. We're doing this program online because most of us are in quarantine due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's an anxious time for all of us. And as we compulsively disinfect everything anyone might have touched and then wonder what we missed because that's the thing that's going to get us, um, I guess you could call this pandemic paranoia. But if we're scared, imagine how scared are the 71 million displaced persons in the world. As Andre said, most are unprotected by either governments or their living conditions. Take Syria as an example. 25% of the world's displaced population is Syrian, the largest displacement of any group. 
and fewer than 10% of them are in refugee camps where they can at the very least receive a modicum of medical services. The medical infrastructure in their home country has collapsed because of ongoing attacks on healthcare workers and facilities. Clean water is a luxury. PPE is almost non-existent. And how can people be socially distanced when they're packed so densely into urban squats or overcrowded encampments? Today, we're going to hear from a cross-section of three organizations, one very large, one mid-size, and one small. They're working directly with those who've been driven from their homes, and I'm proud to have a connection with all of them. First, the International Rescue Committee, where I've served first as a board member and now as an overseer for the past 27 years. IRC was founded in 1933 by Albert Einstein to rescue Jews from Hitler's Germany. And today it's one of the largest and most effective refugee rescue and resettlement organizations in the world. It operates in 200 areas around the globe with more than 11,000 staff members. It's a large contractor to the UN and the US government, but there's been little to no government funding for IRC to deal with COVID-19. David Miliband, former Minister of Foreign Affairs for the UK, is IRC's president, and we're honored to have him on this panel. Welcome, David. Next is RAID an Israel-based NGO, which was founded in 2001 and currently operates in 15 locations worldwide. Since its founding, Israel has responded to natural disasters, provided humanitarian aid, and worked on long-term development in more than 50 countries. I've come to know Israel as a partner organization in the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees. Yotam Polizar is the CEO, and to mention just a few of his achievements, he led Israel's mission in Lesbos to support Syrian refugees. He established Israel Germany, giving long-term support for Yazidi and Syrian refugees, and he created psychosocial programs in Japan after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. I'm so pleased that Yotam could join us from this discussion, and I think he's joining from Israel. And Aharon Aharon Haviv, the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees, which I founded in 2013, is focused entirely on Syrian war victims. MFA's network is made up of more than 100 faith-based and secular organizations committed to aiding Syrian war victims. MFA has partnered with the IDF to deliver massive amounts of aid through the Golan Heights to Southwest Syria. And following the retaking of that region by the regime and its allies, MFA is sending aid to hard to access areas in northern Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. Shadi Martini, a Syrian refugee himself, is executive director. And in him, we have a true hero, a hero with a target on his back, who has risked his life countless times to help his people. And with that, I'm going to open it up to the panel. And David, let me throw the first question to you. IRC has just issued a report, and The New Yorker has just published an interview with you on COVID-19 and refugees. Please give us the view from 30,000 feet, and maybe you can include some of the geopolitics as well. Thank you very much, Georgette. It's a real privilege to be with uh, you. Thank you for your extraordinary leadership in the six years that I've been in New York leading the International Rescue Committee. You've been a remarkable voice, but also a remarkable force for action. And great uh, to be here with Andres. Thank you for convening this Jewish Funders Network. And I think your words about the moral imperative associated with helping others is really profound and important. I have to say that Yotam and Shadi are really extraordinary leaders in their own right, and I'm delighted to be sharing a platform with them. I think the way to understand the refugee crisis is to remember there was a refugee crisis before COVID. Uh, the 70 million displaced uh, people, refugees and internally displaced that you mentioned has actually been now augmented by the latest figures 
from the Norwegian Refugee Council's annual survey of internal displacement, which now registers 50 million internally displaced, not 40 million. And so in addition to the 30 million refugees and asylum seekers, you end up with a one in every 100 people on the planet being forcibly displaced. And those are the people that we at the International Rescue Committee care about and work for in 34 countries and 34 field sites that you mentioned. I apologize if you can all hear noise downstairs. There's crowd control going on of two children and one mother um, arguing about who's going to, I don't know, set the table for lunch or um, have lunch or eat lunch or not eat lunch or whether or not there's too much sugar to be had for lunch. Anyway, I apologize if there's uh, background uh, effects. It's all, all part of our new lives. Uh, we're renting a little cottage in northwest Connecticut where we're joined by, there's no COVID, but there are mice and bears we have discovered. Um, anyway, uh, look, I, I think the way to understand this COVID crisis for the people that we serve is quite simple. It's a double emergency. It's a health emergency for reasons I'll come into, but it's also an economic and social emergency because of the collateral damage that arises from uh, the health crisis. Uh, the health crisis we know from the United States and other advanced industrialized countries that have not handled the crisis well, that even with an advanced health system, the crisis can become overwhelming. In places where we work, South Sudan, where there are four ventilators for the whole population, uh, in somewhere like Cox's Bazaar in uh, Bangladesh, which is home to a million refugees from Myanmar, uh, where uh, the density of population is between four and seven times that in New York, uh, you can see the immediate dangers. There's a million people, by the way, in Cox's Bazaar living in a former elephant forest. The forest was knocked down and people are living uh, there. So the health emergency is that the conditions are ripe for this disease to spread fast. Uh, despite the youthfulness of the population, there are over 280 million people over the age of 50 in the 34 countries where we work. Uh, and also the health infrastructure is very weak uh, indeed. And that uh, hole in the global health safety net creates the health emergency. Uh, the latest figures that we've heard, for example, from Pakistan, uh, which is home to two and a half million Afghan refugees, are really chilling. The first 5,000 cases in Pakistan took 45 days to be recorded. The most recent 5,000 cases took two days to be recorded. So you can see the exponential growth working its way through the population there. The second part of the emergency is that the people we help are living on the edge and the economic and social damage, the collateral damage of the lockdown of the economy, uh, of the close down of society, that comes for people who are living precariously is obviously very grave indeed. We're particularly concerned about 18 million malnourished children, uh, acutely malnourished children in the 34 countries in which we uh, work. We're also very worried about the collat literal collateral damage in rising levels of violence against women and girls, which are a feature of many uh, emergency situations. So the picture from 30,000 feet is of a double emergency and of a world community which through its governments is at the moment frozen in the headlights. Uh, the uh, focus of governments around the world is on their national situation, in some ways understandably, but uh, their focus cannot end there. It becomes myopia if you're only focused on your own national circumstances for a disease that is genuinely global. And our message is a very simple one, that until this disease is quashed everywhere, it won't be sufficiently quashed anywhere. And so there is an absolutely pressing need to mobilize the donor community uh, to stimulate uh, the kind of preventative work that is still possible, but also the therapeutic and other work that is gonna be essential to keep lives and livelihoods together. And I'm looking forward to the questions that come from you, Georgette, and from others uh, in the audience uh, to make sure that we respond to the particular concerns that any of the people have. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. And we will be taking questions from the audience at 1245. But for now, um, Shadi and Yotam, um, please tell us from the perspective of your own organization, what are you seeing as the needs on the ground? Let's, let's start with Shadi. Well, uh, thank you, Georgette, and thank you everyone for participating in this webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet all of you, and uh, good evening to everyone who's in Israel. Um, 
so the situation regarding specifically Syria, where we are concentrating our effort, is, um, is, is something similar to other disaster uh, areas that David had mentioned. But uh, the situation over there is um, a, a little bit uh, special because the presence of war and displaced, continuing displacement. So we have uh, recently have additional displacement of about 900 uh, people, just in uh, 900,000 people just in December. And these people have been displayed for the fourth or fifth time. So that's uh, an adding pressure on this uh, segment of the population. Now, in case of our work, we're working in two aspects. One is uh, prevention and one uh, in response to any COVID uh, you know, uh, uh, epidemic happening in these areas. So in the uh, case of prevention, we're looking on more hygiene materials being distributed, raising the awareness of the population. A lot of the population don't have the information needed to know how to protect themselves, uh, you know, and also bedding housing conditions. So a lot of people had to cramp in small houses, uh, two families had to sleep in, uh, in one tent, and of course, water supply. So that's, that's all of the things that are needed because water supplies help them uh, you know, wash their hands. A simple thing that we do everywhere in the world, it's a challenge for someone living in a tent that doesn't have uh, running water. It's, it's a challenge to take a bath. It, all of these things are challenges for this population. So we're trying to help them with this. And in terms of uh, response, we are already trying to uh, send PPEs to um, aid workers as, uh, and trying to make them better prepared in, uh, in the case of the epidemic spreading there. And, uh, and it's, it's really a challenge because what happens is all of a sudden all the wards wants PPE. So how do you take from one area and send it? You know, if you come to the case here in the United States, wherever you go anywhere, they tell you, you know, our local population is, is most important. So it's also a challenge. In our case, we were, we were, you know, last year we sent PPEs in advance, in advance of any epidemic. It was, uh, you know, it was a good initiative on our side, but very, very few organizations have done that. And it's very, it's very difficult when the epidemic starts to be able to send sufficient uh, PPEs to the medical workers. And of course, the other thing is tests. We don't have enough tests. So even if people are uh, sick, we don't know how to get tested them. So these are the issues that we are facing and we're trying, we're trying to address as also it's, uh, you know, if I want to give an overview of the situation in Syria, which is divided virtually into three or four parts, you have one area which is isolated in northwest Syria. Now we have no cases. Probably isolation is working. You know, this is the first time we can say, oh, hooray, that no one is letting Syrian refugees or anyone out of this area. But if infection happens, we don't know how we're going to stop it. There is an area which is controlled by the current government where we have for instance, 48 cases, and that's the, probably the reason because of uh, foreign fighters coming in, specifically the Iranian case where there is a lot of military coming from Iran, and that's probably the reason we have this. And we have northeast Syria where we have one case that was contained, and we have one area and enclave where Turkish forces is. We had two cases, and which is also might be the effect of uh, spillover from Turkey. So at the moment, we're seeing more coming the effect from outside than generating from inside Syria. Thank you. So Sh Shadi, I just want to um, build on a couple of points that you made before we turn to Yotam. The, the point that you raised about uh, raising awareness um, among the population uh, reminds me of a point that David made in his New Yorker interview about the role of trust that until the people with whom you're dealing trust the source of the information, you, you really can't uh, make any headway in, in terms of, of the medical uh, issues. And um, you're mentioning Iran. I, I think it's important to remind everybody that Iran has actually become the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in the Middle East. And Iran is exporting it. Uh, Shadi mentioned that um, 
because of the foreign fighters coming into, into Syria. Well, of course, many of those militias are Iranian and they come into Syria and their weapons come into Syria through uh, Mahan Air, the same airline that kept flying from Iran to China uh, after the pandemic began. And so that was brought in from China. So I just wanted to mention that because there are geopolitical aspects to this crisis as well. So Yotam, sorry, please jump in. <laughs> Sure, no, thank you. Um, so, so Shadi and David covered a lot of the needs on the ground, but really, um, you know, just to kind of visualize it for, for all of our participants, um, you know, one of the places where we operate actually in partnership with IRC is Kakuma Refugee Camp um, in Northern Kenya, where, you know, there are 200,000 refugees, one of the largest uh, refugee camps in the world, um, and there's simply not enough hand washing stations. We're not talking about PPE. We're not talking about masks. We're not talking about ventilators, of course. I mean, uh, David mentioned, and, and another country where we operate is South Sudan. In the whole country of South Sudan, there are four ventilators. So this is what we're talking about. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the other side effects. Um, so David mentioned GBV, gender-based violence, which is something that we've seen a lot of increase uh, during this time. Um, in, in, in vulnerable population like displaced people and refugee camps, etc. I mean, we, uh, we have seen a lot of um, increase in mental health issues, mental health protection and trauma. And this is an area that's really neglected uh, um, in regular days, uh, but even more so during the, the COVID um, pandemic. I mean, we work in uh, one of our largest operations is with the Venezuelan refugees in um, Colombia. Colombia only, there's about 1.6 million Venezuelan refugees uh, who went through a terrible trauma back home and now they have another layer of trauma and an economic crisis and a health crisis. So uh, the different layers of trauma here uh, is, is just overwhelming. The stress, the anxiety, um, the PTSD, et cetera. Um, in, in Greece, um, in the refugee camps, um, again, Syrian refugees, Yazidi refugees who went through the worst atrocities a person could think of and, and, and Shadi could actually share from, from his personal experience. Um, you know, these are people who are now locked down, who are now isolated, who are now in a much more stressful situation. So this is the, the vulnerability we mentioned. Again, just touching upon the PPE, the, the, the good news or one of the really inspiring stories that we've seen, and I know a lot of uh, initiatives that were similar is that a lot of the refugees that we work with, many of them are actually our staff members, um, have started to produce masks and uh, PPE, uh, not only for themselves, but also for the host community. So this is um, kind of maybe taking us uh, to the next step of the discussion, but talking about how this crisis could turn into an opportunity. And, and we can see something we call uh, post-traumatic growth, PTG, um, is really how refugees are, are, are actually helping the general population. We've seen this in Greece, uh, in Germany, um, some of the Syrian and Iranian refugees that are Israel staff are actually producing masks for Holocaust survivor in Berlin. Um, so, so this is the good news in, in, in this crisis. Thank you, Yotam. Uh, that, was, that was very inspiring and it's a good segue into into the next question I'd like to direct at any of you who want to jump in, which is we now have a sense of what the needs are, but how has COVID-19 impacted on your ability to deliver services? Anybody? I'm happy to answer because um, I think it's really important that um, we don't allow the message to go out that because um, Yotam and Shadi and I have described the length and breadth of the problem, that somehow we think it's insoluble. Because I think that um, Yotam's point that small interventions can make a big difference when combined with the resilience and courage of the people that we serve is really uh, important. We've uh, set three priorities for ourselves. One, to keep our staff safe. We have, as Georgette said, uh, 13,000 actually employees and another 17,000 auxiliary workers, many of whom are refugees and displaced people themselves. And priority number one, if you want to deliver services, is to keep your staff safe. 
because if your staff aren't safe, then you're not able to deliver the services. Um, and that includes PPE kit for health staff. I, I'm very proud that our team in Bangladesh were ordering PPE kit on the 8th of February, well before uh, many governments were realizing the significance of the uh, danger and of the crisis. Um, but the, it also means making sure uh, that the staff who are not in health role, not in a health role, not in health facilities, deliver services in a way that's adapted to a COVID environment. So the second priority is program continuity, our education programs, our women's protection programs, our, even our, our cash distribution programs, very, very uh, important. Also our health programs beyond COVID, so family planning, etc. cetera, um, reproductive health, maternal health. And that ad program adaptation is a second absolutely vital uh, priority because we need to make sure that the double emergency that I described doesn't become a double uh, trauma. And so to the extent that we're using radio to reach out to uh, kids for uh, schooling uh, outside the um, classroom, uh, we can uh, make a difference. The third area is programmatic response, above all in the health field, where we would like to amp up our uh, health uh, response, first of all at the prevention stage, your time is absolutely right. For want of a bar of soap, the disease takes root. For want of a testing station, the uh, afflicted then infect others. For want of isolation areas, the disease uh, goes rife. And I think it's really important that the programmatic response starts with prevention. It moves through to uh, therapeutic support because uh, before you get to the need for a ventilator, there's a whole range of primary care that's uh, important. And so uh, that is that those three priorities have guided us for the last two and a half months. And I don't want to hide from you many of the difficulties. I was on the phone on the Zoom, actually, uh, this morning with uh, our team in East Africa. That's seven uh, countries, including Somalia, South Sudan, um, Ethiopia, uh, all of which are quite seriously affected. And um, there is interference because of domestic travel restrictions. There are worries about PPE, although I have to say we are uh, okay on the PPE front at the moment. And uh, above all, there's a sense that the world has forgotten too many of the parts that we work with. And so there's grave concern that as grants come to an end, uh, there's gonna be a real struggle for continuity. And that's uh, leading us to innovate, but it's also uh, leaving us to, to worry. I think that uh, if I may just pick up a final point, uh, you, you rightly seized on the question, Georgette, about information. And I don't, I, I've been warned not to use the term fake news because in a way it does, uh, even to use the word news in respect of invention and lies, uh, gives it a false, um, uh, a false respectability. But um, there is a real challenge of information provision by credible trusted uh, parties because uh, there's a lot of, um, conspiracy mongering uh, that is taking place and that can lead communities to turn on each other it can lead them to turn against NGOs um, and uh, I think that since the disease hasn't yet run completely rampant there's even a, a sense of complacency creeping in in some parts of Africa for example there is now uh, they're now in a post lockdown situation and that's um, very worrying so our services continue with our staff at the center and a desperate struggle to make sure that our clients don't catch the disease and continue to receive other services because uh, the dangers they face are very real. Um, yeah, if I, if I may jump here. Um, so, so continuing on David's point, I think um, for us, um, I mean, two of the main kind of characteristics of this raid um, is very um, strong community-based approach. So a lot of our work is always done in the community in partnership with the community, a lot of trainings and sessions and workshops and distributions. Um, and the second thing is, is, is quick response to disasters, which you know, we, we use to jump on a plane and have our disaster response team arrive usually within the first 72 hours. Um, that has been a major challenge for us. And I was deeply, deeply concerned. Uh, I share with David, the first priority was obviously the safety of our staff. But the second priority was making sure that we're actually effective, that we actually can make a difference um, to these vulnerable communities. And, um, and, and, and again, the good news was that almost in all of our countries of operation, we have amazing teams, primarily of local staff. Many of them are refugees themselves from Syria, Iraq, 
South Sudan, um, Venezuela, etc. And, and also a small team of international staff. So the fact that we were there on the ground uh, and we already have trust with the community and we speak their language, it's, it's, um, it helped us a lot in fight what we all call, uh, for lack of a better word, the infodemic really how you spread information in a way that's reliable, that's culturally sensitive in the language where people can actually understand it um, and, and to, to different populations, whether it's uh, uh, elderly or, or, or young children in our child-friendly spaces. Um, so that has been a lot of our response. And the second uh, part, which is again, going back to this um, PTG, post-traumatic growth, which is a term we really love to use here, um, uh, at Israel um, is really um, the online work, which I was very skeptical about. I thought like, how can we really give online support, psychological support or psychosocial support for, for people who are traumatized? But actually our teams have done incredible work and in being very creative and creating models and content for parents, uh, for children, um, using a lot of videos and animation and all of these uh, tools um, which I think we will use way after COVID will be gone. Um, so so I, I was very impressed and I was really impressed with how the refugees, for example, in Greece created the whole YouTube channel in seven different languages uh, and they're now uploading content and they're always um, online. So, so it, it was really a great opportunity for them to learn, um, you know, tech skills and, and skills and, and life skills that will be useful way after this crisis. Thank you. Shadi, uh, do you want to jump in before we yeah. move on to another question? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Well, for, in, in our case, uh, of course, the supply chain has been affected to a certain degree. Uh, most of our provider of aid materials have readjusted their work and readjusted their focus. Some of them have went to focus locally. Some just uh, logistically couldn't uh, provide the services that they provided before. It included packing and uh, people working in one warehouse, so they can't do it and they have to readjust. So that affected our supplies. For instance, we used to have uh, a program of uh, ready-to-cook meals, uh, pre-packed and sent to uh, to Syria, uh, we couldn't. So what we do is we readjusted of uh, sending in bulk supplies and providing a kitchen in the area that would cook the meals and distribute it. Uh, the same thing happened with masks, for instance, with hand sanitizers. Uh, we had to re replace this with locally manufactured one that manufactured and set in, uh, distributed in hygiene kits. Um, that's, uh, but that's also a lot of uh, pressure on, uh, on, on organizations' uh, finances because it's, uh, you, you used to receive some of this stuff in in-kind. Now you have to finance it out of your own budget, which is a burden on a lot of organizations. And of course, the restrictions, uh, stay-at-home restrictions and some restrictions in neighboring countries hampered the abilities of uh, cross-border work. But... Uh, luckily, most of the local uh, partners we work with are locals. They live there, so it's their community. So they they have to adjust and they have to do what they have to do. But also that gave us the level of trust with the local community that when you tell them about the situation and the dangers and what they need to do, these are their neighbors. They feel that if it's a danger for them, uh, then they won't lie to them. So that's somehow countering this uh, false uh, information that is being spread and to help people uh, stay safe. Thank you. So uh, I think Shadi was getting at some of the mechanics of actually getting aid to where it needs to go. And one of the things that MFA has noticed, of course, is, for example, goods going through Turkey because of the pandemic, a lot of customs agents are not on duty. And so that slows the processing of uh, the, the cargo containers of aid that are, that are coming in. So let's, um, let's get to uh, some of the talkless now. Um, what are the gaps that can be filled by the philanthropic community, since the audience that we have here with us today is an audience of philanthropists? What gaps can they fill? What can they usefully do? Uh, 
you want us to do that in the same order, Georgette, or what, whatever order, whatever order you like. Yeah. Well, Yo, Tom hasn't had a chance to go first yet, so let's start with Yo, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I think most important thing is to understand that this is a long term crisis. Um, we're not just talking about it in terms of the second or third or fourth wave, which we all are very concerned about in our home countries, um, but really to understand that the recovery process um, for the most vulnerable communities will take a long time. So what we're, um, what we're focusing on right now is not just the immediate response uh, and, and providing the immediate relief, which is crucial, but also looking at all these um, long-term thinking, whether it's mental health, uh, gender-based violence, um, water and sanitation, education, um, so all of, all of the above. And I think, um, again, the good news is that with very modest um, investment, um, and I think Shadi and David will share, will share that um, notion with me, with very modest investment, you can make a huge difference because um, the teams on the ground are refugees themselves. We're not talking necessarily about uh, right now about the need to fly people across the world, but we really support um, the local teams, the local refugees, the local uh, grassroots uh, entities and, and initiatives um, that are, are desperately need support right now, and they will need even more support in three to six months from now. Shadi, why don't you go next? Sorry, just trying to unmute. Uh, yes, actually, uh, just to go back to your last comment about uh, Turkish uh, customs agent and even the truckers, you know, a truck, it was, was is sometimes a challenge to get a truck here or anywhere in the world. But in the case of the philanthropic sector, well, uh, it, it, it's really, it really was very important all along. But since COVID 19s have happened, its, it's uh, importance have uh, doubled or tripled, even. Uh, you know, for instance, a lot of uh, organizations. Let's let's talk about our organization, multi Multiface Alliance for Syrian Refugees. You you know, we de we depend on events, we depend on, on on things to to raise funds for our our causes, for our programs. That that's all had to be canceled. That all had to be changed. We had to adapt. You know, different organization adapt in a different way according to its size, its abilities. So uh, a lot of uh, the philanthropic work, I think, is is, is very much needed specifically for organizations that had limited capacity but a lot of uh, effect uh, on the ground to come in and help in uh, continuing their programs uh, for the time being and and in, in general COVID-19 have have also applied additional pressure on for instance UN organizations that uh, that has been already been stressed has already had gaps in, in in its funding and the burden has been left on other organizations organization on a smaller scale of private uh, organizations that had to fill a bigger gap than uh, than was out there. So COVID has increased the, the gap and has increased the, the pressure on uh, that private NGOs. So I mean, the philanthropic sector is needed more than ever at the moment. It's it's very important for them and uh, to fill this gap because. Uh, we don't know the effects, the long-term effects. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, I think, at the moment, and we are not out of the wood with COVID-19, so it's, it's going for us for next year. So it's very, very paramount to step in and, and, and try to fill this gap as much as possible. Thanks. And I, I do want to underscore something that I said in, in my opening remarks, which is uh, that government money uh, really has not been forthcoming. I think David can speak directly to this, and that makes the gap even even wider. David, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Georgette. Look, I think there are three very practical ways that this network can make a difference. Uh, route number one to impact is to focus on prevention. It's almost embarrassing to say this, but it's the truth. The governments are neglecting prevention, but we all know that prevention is better than cure. And so um, when Yotam says we have the people, 
a million dollars will give you, if you through the IRC, 10,000 health community workers for two months. That's a really significant hygiene promoters, people who are doing community mobilization around prevent prevention of COVID. That's a really serious uh, issue. And money for prevention is absolutely key. Secondly, uh, vulnerable groups have been um, mentioned. And I think these come in a number of categories. They could be geographically marginal. They could be demographically uh, marginal, whether for religious reasons, but also subgroups like uh, um, we know from the evidence that girls are much less likely to go back to school when schools reopen after closing. So there's a whole group of adolescent, often girls, who uh, need help. So there are particular marginalized uh, groups that I think should be at the forefront of uh, philanthropic thinking. And then third, philanthropy isn't just a hole filler. It's also a catalyst. And for us, the catalyst is innovation. Money for innovation is the, is the medium-term counterpart to short-term prevention. We need to prevent in the short term we, and mobilize to do so. We need to target the vulnerable groups also in the short term, but we also need to, to change the way we do our business so that we're better insulated, better resilient, more able to withstand the shocks of the future. And that innovation in the way that the humanitarian sector programs is absolutely key and often that means risk. And for us, private philanthropy is our, it's our venture capital, it's our risk capital because governments are not great at taking uh, risks. So I hope that uh, people listening to this call will think about the humanitarian sector as prevention, as vulnerable groups, but also as innovation. And of course I understand charity begins at home, but as Andres said at the beginning, charity cannot end at home. And that's the challenge that I think is posed to us. Georgette, you're on Thank mute. You. Thank you. <laughs> David, that was a, a terrific recap of, of what the philanthropic sector can do. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Uh, we have a number of questions that have come in, but we have two minutes left before I do that. So just to um, hammer home that final point that David made just now and that Andres made at the beginning. In answer to the question, is this really the time to divert resources from research, supplies, and services that are so urgently needed at home when our economies have collapsed and tens of thousands of our own people are sick or have died? Is this the time? So please take 30 seconds each to hammer home the point about why this is the time. Well, I, I can go first, Tom. I, I, I think it's not an easier or question. You know, COVID-19 and some events before it showed us that if events happening far away from home can affect us directly, uh, maybe sooner than later. Uh, I understand individuals need to look more at their communities, it's also important not to in, in, ignore what's happening around the world. Um, you know, and, and also at, at home, we're, we're, uh, for instance, the United States, we are increasing our ability to detect COVID-19 and prepare medical staff, uh, increase our stockpiles of uh, ventilators. We, we would come to a point where we, we are very well prepared and we will have a surplus. So we can uh, naturally, uh, you know, donate some of these uh, surplus and help NGOs around the, uh, the world. And specifically in the case of Syria's war victim, it's a humanitarian necessity at first, but it's also showed us that neglecting the whole generation of people in the heart of the Middle East, for instance, is also a strategic national security mistake that will cost us with humanitarian uh, Shadi, diplomacy. Shadi, you were breaking up. Can okay, you sorry about go, that. Go back five seconds because you were saying something so, very important. Okay, so in the case National of the security. Yes, so I'm just giving an example in the case of the Syrian war victims. It's a humanitarian necessity at first, but has also showed us that neglecting the whole generation of people in the heart of Middle East, for example, is also a strategic national security mistake that will cost us much more in the future. Uh, you know, let's call it humanitarian diplomacy. It works. It helps dispersed populations survive and plant the seeds for a better future in the Middle East in this case. Thank you. 
So uh, please, just 30 seconds each. Uh, David, Yo, Tom. So I would appeal to uh, head as well as heart in the way that Shadi uh, did. Of course, there are needs locally, but there are many, 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 many organizations, individuals, government agencies addressing the needs locally, the holes in the safety net locally. But this is a disease of the connected world. And so our heads should tell us that it has to be addressed in a connected way. And the truth is that for the most vulnerable parts of the world, and especially the most vulnerable people in the most vulnerable parts of the world, if we don't look out for them, uh, no one else uh, will. Uh, and if that doesn't frighten you enough, then um, think about this. The geopolitics of this are that humanitarian diplomacy is being practiced by a range of other actors. Some of them are governmental actors, like China, which is engaging in various acts of um, humanitarian benevolence uh, at the moment, uh, but also non-state actors, uh, some of them with uh, malign motives, some of them with more benign uh, motives. But I think it's very, very important that if we don't understand that this is a disease of the connected world, we will suffer the burdens of a connected world and be unable to enjoy the blessings. And so I think that there's a really important um, argument of the head as well as the argument of the heart. And my final point is that the greatest tyranny is to feel that we can't make a difference. The problems are so big that there's no point in making a dent. And I think all the evidence of history is that we can make a dent. And when we do, we make a difference. Yo, Tom. Okay, very quickly. So just adding two points. One, um, I totally agree. It's not either or. In fact, Israel, for the first time in our history, we're actually operating inside Israel right now, helping asylum seekers here, and also have a massive operation within the US and Italy. But look, these are the most vulnerable communities. We all agree on that. We, we already see the effect, but we'll see the effects much more. And with very modest, very, very modest investment. David gave a great number, one million people, one million dollars, sorry. Uh, we can bring so much support and we can prevent a lot of it. So, and prevention will help this population first, but it will also help us in the long run because it will prevent the disease from spreading again from the second, the third wave, or, or, or any kind of economic effect that we will feel also in our part of the world. Um, and, and last, I really do think we have responsibility here. Um, and I know this is a group of, of Jewish funders. Um, I think this is a very Jewish thing. Uh, for us, um, it's a very Israeli thing um, to help the most vulnerable and to help the refugees. Um, and it will be an opportunity not only to really save more lives or support the most vulnerable, but it will also be an opportunity to build more bridges between people um, sometimes that have considered themselves enemies. And I think, you know, Shadi and I, who became great friends, is just one example. Um, of how these crises could turn into an incredible opportunity um, to build bridges. So, Yo, Tom, um, I really want to pick up on the last point you made because actually a question came in about this, about whether this is an opportunity for Israelis and Arabs to work together. But I'm going to I'm going to direct that question to Shadi. But first, I know that Andres wanted to jump in with something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Georgette. Um, just one, one comment I want to make is that at JFN, we never look at philanthropy as a zero-sum game. Uh, there, is, there are enormous philanthropic resources in, in the Jewish community and in the world at large. And one of the good things about this crisis is that it, it catches up in a moment of of, of, of uh, strength. I mean, there is, there is a lot of um, rainy day found out there, and this is the mother of all rainy days. So I think that this is the, this is the time for philanthropists to, to be bold in their giving, to realize that it doesn't have to be at the expense of research in the Western world, uh, that there is enough um, assets out there that to, to help all the needs. And yes, there's going to be sacrifices, but we can do it. I mean, David says we can do it. And, and as somebody who works with funders day in and day out, 
I, I, I can tell you we can do it if we put our hearts and mind to it. The, the, the second thing I wanted to say is um, there are other very concrete uh, initiatives of people that are actually raising resources for, for these. Uh, Israel and the IRC are, are, are um, you can check in their websites for specific opportunities. So at JFN, we generally don't say these things, which report to be solicitation free, but if you want to know what you can do, you can check them and you can also check a specific initiative in which we are partnering with the MFA, which is a program to uh, provide PPE to uh, displaced uh, persons and refugees in, in Syria. So those of you looking for concrete things to do after this call, you can either use these avenues or contact us for, for more specific information. Back to you. Thank you. I love the mother of all rainy days. That's great, Andres. So, Shadi, um, very briefly, because I see we have only eight minutes left for questions from the audience. Tell us about opportunities of oh. Israelis and Arabs working together to deliver humanitarian aid. But keep, um, I'll, keep it I'm brief. the example in keep front your of American you. self, not your Syrian self. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> but but I'm, I'm the example in, in front of you. I was raised in Syria. I was raised in an educational system in Syria. No, no love to Israel, no love to Jews. This is how we, we were indoctrinated. Uh, but sometimes out of a tragedy comes a positive things. And from the Syrian tragedy came a positive things when there is an outreach from Israeli uh, NGOs like Yatam and like others to come to aid Syrians. And also with the opening of the Golan Heights border by the Israeli government and the IDF to help uh, wounded Syrians and uh, bring aid, which I participated in. I, I can tell you, I never thought I would go to Israel. I've, I've been in Israel, I don't know how many times now. Even the, the guy in, uh, in Yafu, who or I go and order shisha from, knows me now. He knows even my flavor. So, I mean, this is, this is the reality that if you told me prior to 2011 that will happen, I'll say you're crazy. You know, you're nuts. I see it in the eyes of Syrians, I see it in their attitude. I see it in, in other Arab nations who have been encouraged because the Syrian situation was very unique for Israel. Israel wasn't occupying uh, territories in, in Syria uh, so when it sent the aid. It wasn't, it wasn't it, there was no strategic interest. So everyone saw it as the humanitarian aid, aid it is. And it really resonated with a lot of Syrians. and. I just uh, always love to mention this uh, thing. I was going to a tribal leader and trying to tell them that this aid is coming uh, through Israel, but I was I was worried to tell him. I said, I'm going to admit to you something, but I don't know if you'll accept this aid. And he said, what? You got me worried. And I said, well, this aid is coming through Israel. And he said, oh my God, I thought you were going to tell me it was coming from Iran or Hezbollah. So this is why I was worried. If it's Israel, it's fine. I was like, wow, something has changed apparently in, in Syria's mind. And this is across the board. So outreach does work. It's helpful. And it's, it's, it's really something that we should do more of in the case of Syria and other places around the world. Thanks, Shadi. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to either David or Yotam. And that question has to do with once therapies and vaccines become available, is there a mechanism for distributing those to refugees? Which, which one of you would like to take that question? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Um, we, we, our um, approach to the crisis has five elements. Um, one is prevention, as I've said. The second is about uh, curative or therapeutic response. The third is about immediate collateral damage. The fourth is about program adaptation. And the fifth is precisely about this question of filling the holes in the safety net to make sure that the vaccine reaches all those in need. And I think there are two parts to the answer to the question. Are there mechanisms, plural, to reach those people? Yes. If you're willing to work through a range of community-based NGOs, you can reach all the people on the planet. Uh, but is there a mechanism to rally the vaccine and its production for global use rather than just for local or national use in the country that it's invented or in the markets that can pay for it? No, there isn't. And so there's a very live international debate 
less about the delivery of the vaccine and more about who has access to it in order to deliver it. And that is something that I think is going to be very important. If you listen to the BBC this morning, which I did, um, there's a very um, live debate about um, which of the um, 100 plus vaccine drives is going to win. There's a great fear that in certain hands, the country, the, the origin, the home country of the country that wins will uh, restrict its use to its own citizens first. And there was a very powerful scientific voice on the radio this morning making the point that it's got to be done. Of course, there'll be um, the, the country that, uh, if it's Oxford or Imperial College London, it's easier to find your population and to distribute it. But there's got to be an international mechanism, an international commitment to make this um, vaccine as widely available as possible, precisely because we're not all safe until we're all safe. And so I think that um, it's a, there's more depth to that question is realized, but I promise you we're ready to go and distribute it as soon as it's available. And I know that uh, Israel Aid and MFA also have their local partners on the ground who are also ready to distribute. Yo, Tom, I'm going to direct the next question to you. As the world is going isolationist, how can we, meaning the audience, uh, the question comes from the audience, contribute to keep this issue in the forefront? Great question. Um, I think there's so much going on in terms of information and events and webinars and you name it from all sides of the spectrum. And I think the question is very simple um, in, and, and, it, and it is going back to the, the levels of vulnerability. Um, and I think, you know, we, we see it here in Israel uh, where we had quite, you know, a widespread um, uh, of, of the virus here. It was very hard for people to think out of their families, out of their neighborhoods, out of their uh, cities, and definitely out of their country, um, which we totally understand. But I think as we're seeing, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm very careful with what I'm saying, I'm not a scientist, but as we're seeing um, slowly uh, um, a flattening off of the curve, as we all like to say, in, um, in different parts of the Western world, um, in Europe and in the US and, and definitely in Israel, we actually can officially go to the beach um, from Wednesday, which my, my, uh, my kids are very much looking forward because it will be the first time in the beach. They're only nine months old. Um, but um, so, so I, I think we really need to, as we're shifting to a more safe place ourselves, we really need to remember um, and look at the most vulnerable people. Um, many of them are refugees and displaced. Um, we need to help them because if we won't help them, it will backfire on us and because it's really the right thing to do. All right, last question to you, David because uh, you do so much work with uh, the UN and other international bodies. And that question is, what is the role of international agencies like UNICEF and the UN? And 30 seconds, please. Well, I wish we did more work with them because at the moment, uh, the partnership isn't what it needs to be. Uh, the United Nations has unique legitimacy. It has unique global pulling power. Uh, but it also has unique challenges given the national interests that decide the way it works. And so um, in the $2 billion appeal that the UN launched um, two months ago, only 100 million was uh, reserved for NGOs. And as of the Friday before last, only 13 million had been given. So at the moment, we have got an international sector that isn't working to the kind of uh, efficiency that would uh, really uh, the crisis behooves. And so um, I think it's really important to recognize that there are some specific um, agency issues. Uh, for example, uh, the World Health Organization needs to be stronger in my view, not weaker, better able to speak truth to power, to be more independent in the way it inspects and reports on health uh, risks. Uh, but there also needs to be effective coordination uh, and that takes a wider UN uh, system. And so I would say that at the moment, uh, the UN is suffering from the kind of uh, short-sightedness that um, is leading nations like this one to threaten cuts to the UN, to the uh, World Health Organization. Um, but even if those are restored, I think we've got work to do to improve the kind of functioning that uh, a global body needs to 
um, be able to aspire to. And so I'm afraid there's work to be do done on that front and it can't be neglected in our focus on the near term. There are some big lessons of this crisis. And for me, they speak to the need for a much more effective international system, but maybe that's a matter for a, another seminar. Yes, it will have to be for, for another webinar because we have reached our time. I want to thank you very much, Yotam Palizar, Isra Aid, Shadi Martini, Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees, David Miliband, International Rescue Committee, Andres Vaconi. Thank you so much to the Jewish Funders Network for doing what it always does so well, which is to bring important issues to the attention of philanthropists. And to Mar Friedman, thank you for your coordination. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Georgette, for moderating. And thank you to all the panelists. If anybody wants to get more information or wants help connecting with anybody that, uh, with anybody that they heard today, please reach out to me at tamar at jfunders.org. This is really hopefully just the start of the conversation and we're here to help you get connected. And please look at jfunders.org for our upcoming webinars. We have things going on almost every day. So, and please join us again. Thank you. Stay well, everybody. Stay well, everybody. Thank you very much, Alona. And Hak Sameach.